What's up everybody, Dan again, stocktrades.ca. You're not gonna see much of me in this video. Instead, we are releasing a segment that we've started over at Stock Trades. It's called our Market Mindset segment. We're going to be running monthly uh, Market Mindset episodes in which we spend about 40 minutes to an hour discussing a topic, following it up with a live Q&A. Now, for future episodes, you are going to need to register for them. It's absolutely free, but we figured with this being the first one, we kind of want to release this to the public to see what people are going to expect inside of these segments. This month, we have Matt running a very important topic in the investment world. We're going to speak on dividend growth investing, what it is, the differences between aristocrats here in Canada and the United States. And then we're going to dive into three key dividend mistakes we see people make all the time. And we're going to tell you how you can prevent them. And in this situation, we're going to be talking a lot about a particular stock as of late that has cut the dividend and that is Algonquin Power and Utilities. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to the video and you can listen to Matt. And of note, the free trial to income seekers that he mentions in the segment here, I'm going to leave a link in the description. That is a no credit card required 14 day trial to our income platform, Income Seekers. So again, here's Matt with three dividend mistakes and how you can prevent them. Hey everyone, welcome to the first uh, stocktrades.ca market mindset. Uh, welcome. My name is Matt, uh, and I'll be your host for today. Um, just wanted to bring attention that this is our first event and something that we are using new technology for. So bear with us in case we do have some technological issues. We think we've tested it enough, but you never know. Um, so welcome to the market mindset on three dividend mistakes that you'll want to avoid um, on your investing journey. Before we get started, I did want to talk a little bit about myself, give you a little bit of an intro. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Matt Latalian, uh, Mathieu L'Italien. I am a founding partner of Stock Trades Premium. I have an MBA. I have been investing for the better part of 25 years. Started when I was 18 years old, so I am probably aging myself here. Uh, that said, um, you know, I've slowly, I guess, evolved as an investor. I consider myself to be a dividend growth investor. I would say probably about 70% of my portfolio is in dividend growth stocks. However, I do have a you know considerable portion in growth and high growth and speculative positions. Uh, I'm invested in anything from you know technology to crypto uh, in that other 30%. So just to kind of give you an idea of where I'm coming from. Don't want to spend too much time on that, but uh, yeah, there you go. Quick introduction. Now, before we get into the, I would say, bulk of the presentation, just a quick disclaimer here. All the slides here are the you know property of stock trades, so we do ask that you don't uh, you know copy and distribute uh, without our consent. Uh, the recording itself is actually being recorded, uh, so you will be able to view this later on. Uh, and you know this is our own opinions, right? So when we talk about different stocks, uh, we may or may not own these stocks, and it's our own opinion, not to be construed as financial advice. So that's the too long didn't read TLDR. On our disclaimer here. All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? First, uh, we want to cover some basics, uh, talk a little bit about dividend growth investing, and then we'll get into the bulk of the presentation, which is three dividend mistakes. Uh, throughout the course of the presentation, uh, my colleagues uh, Dan Kent and Dylan Callahan are going to be in the chat. They will be collating all your comments and questions, and they'll be feeding that to me later on in the Q&A so that I can answer your questions live. So with that in mind, let's get right to it. So the reason why we want to talk about the basics is because we know that we have a wide audience. We have some beginner investors. We have some more experienced investors. But every one of these webinars, we will want to do some sort of a little basic understanding of some of the key terms. Um, and I want to just focus and spend a little bit of time on the types of, uh, the types of investors and types of stocks. You can really, I guess, categorize them into three main buckets. Growth investors, so these are investors that will go and look for growth stocks. Typically, a growth stock is defined as somebody that is growing at about a 10% annual clip, uh, you know, double digits, if you will. Uh, value investors, that's pretty straightforward. These are investors that are looking for a 
uh, a discount for to intrinsic, intrinsic value, if you will. So these are the ones that are looking for a deal. And finally, we have the income investors. Uh, and those are ones that are looking for income generating assets. That might be stocks that pay a dividend. That might be stocks that pay a distribution, um, as, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, the three different types. And it's important to note that they aren't interdependent, right? So you can have value investors that are also income investors. You can have income investors that are also growth investors. Uh, same thing goes with the stocks themselves. You can have a stock that fits all these criteria. You know, a good example of this is TFI International uh, that we've uh, talked about several times at Stock Trades Premium, where it was chronically undervalued for a long period of time. And, you know, it also paid, it was also growing at a double digit clip and it was growing the dividend at a double digit clip. So, you know, in our opinion, that was something that we qualify, we quantified as a triple threat, uh, something that falls in all three buckets. So what's a dividend? A dividend is a share of profits and retained earnings that a company pays out to its shareholders and owners. And that's from the Corporate Finance Institute. We like the, the CFI because they provide real simple definitions. Um, and the important part here to remember is that the dividend is actually considered a cash outlay. So it's cash out the door. And I'll explain why that's important in a moment. Now, dividend growth investing is a very popular style of investing, and it's a subset of income investing. So not everybody who's investing for income follows a dividend growth approach. Uh, personally, I mentioned at the beginning, I am a dividend growth investor. Um, and really, it's a specific strategy that's focused on companies that have a long history of growing their dividend, typically five consecutive years or more. There are, I guess, two different ways to look at the different types of dividend growth stocks in Canada and the US, because they are different. So it's important to understand a distinction. In Canada, uh, we have kings, aristocrats, and all-stars. So dividend kings are those companies who have a history of growing the dividend for 50 plus consecutive years. Uh, Canadian Utilities is actually the only dividend king in Canada. Fortis will be next, uh, and they will be here next year. Um, then we have uh, aristocrats and all-stars. Uh, they have a history of growing the dividend for five plus years. Aristocrats is based on uh, an, an index fund, and the All Stars is actually maintained by Dividend Growth and Environment, a popular uh, blogger here in Canada. Then you have in the U.S. you have uh, a different, I guess, subset because the U.S. is much, much bigger than Canada, right? So we have dividend kings once again, fifty plus years. We have the CCC list, which was made popular by the late David Fish. For those of you who have been involved in dividend growth investing over the past two decades, you'd probably be familiar with the name David Fish. He's the one who popularized the Challengers, Contenders, and Champions list, uh, which is available for free on dripinvesting.org. And so challenges, challengers are those who have five to nine years, contenders 10 to 24 years, and champions 25 to 49 years. Now, the U.S. also has an aristocrat index, and that's 25 plus years. So when we talk about dividend aristocrats, right, you can't compare Canada to the U.S. because it's not an apples to apples comparison. In Canada, it's five plus years, and the U.S. is 25 years. Okay, so those are some of the basics, right? Uh, I wanted to bring a couple of those things up because we'll, we'll bring them up as we're talking uh, over the course of the three mistakes to avoid. All right, so here we go. Three mistakes, using the wrong payout ratio, chasing yield, and ignoring low yielders. Let's start with using the wrong payout ratio. So what is a payout ratio, right? When we say payout ratio, what are we talking about? Let's, let's turn to the Corporate Finance Institute again. So the amount of dividends paid to shareholders in relation to the total amount of net income the company generates. So in other words, it's a dividend payout ratio measures the percentage of net income that is distributed to shareholders in the form of dividends. So when you're looking at payout ratios on, let's say, Yahoo or Google on your broker, whenever you see something like payout ratio or standard payout ratio or earnings payout ratio, this is what they're referring to. It's taking the annualized dividend and it's dividing that by the earnings per share. It's a very simple formula, um, but that's typically your standard. So one of the problems is that when you rely solely on that standard payout ratio, you might be making uninformed decision making, right? So not to say that the standard payout ratio isn't a good ratio. It actually works very well in certain cases, but there are also other industries where it doesn't work so well. Uh, secondly, 
we, we believe that cash flow is actually a more accurate gauge of dividend and safety. When we talked about it earlier, remember, ca a dividend is a cash outflow, right? It's cash out the door. So it makes sense to compare it against cash in the door. Next, uh, you know, earnings uh, factor in many accounting items. Sorry, you guys seen that? Um, many accounting items uh, and don't necessarily reflect the money available uh, to pay the dividends, right? Uh, so it may uh, include amortization, it may include one-time acquisition costs and things like that that don't necessarily have a long-term impact on the company's ability to sustain that dividend. So that's why earnings sometimes is not all that you know, good of a gauge in terms of the dividend safety. You want to use other metrics. When we talk about relevant payout ratios by sector, there's about four different sectors and industries that we want to highlight here uh, because they are very unique. Let's start with financials. So financials is probably the one industry, and I'm talking about banks and insurance companies, where the earnings payout ratio, so your standard ratio, is actually very relevant. Because banks, for example, they generate negative free cash flow. So it doesn't make any sense to compare against free cash flow. It's just the nature of their business model, right? They are constantly loaning out in this and that. So just by the, uh, the nature of their business model, they generate negative cash flows. So it doesn't make sense to compare against the cash flows. Uh, for banks, uh, we tend to look for a targeted payout ratio below 50%. You'll see some of the big six banks in Canada, they have typically targeted ratios between 40 and 50%. Not to say something at 60% isn't sustainable, uh, but we prefer it to be kept under 50%, which is usually the standard in the industry. Then we go to telecoms. Uh, so telecoms is an interesting one because, you know, we hear a lot uh, and we've gotten, had a lot of discussion about a company like BCE. Uh, so BCE has a very high payout ratio, a very high standard payout ratio against earnings, right? Uh, I think last I checked, it was close or, or, or above 100%. So you look at it and you're like, hmm, that dividend is not safe. However, if you dig a little bit deeper, their uh, payout ratio against earnings is actually, against cash flow, sorry, is actually much better. Right? So for telecoms, they have a lot of high CapEx, so they are investing consistently. They have high amortization. Um, these, are, these are things that don't necessarily have an impact on paying the dividend. So uh, we, you know, we like to look at it uh, in terms of operational cash flow or free cash flow, and we like to have a target you know, below 80%. You know, circling back to BCE for a second, you know, it only has, I think, something like a 12-year dividend growth streak. can't remember offhand. Uh, but, you know, there's been some criticism uh, against BCE because they also, uh, there are some investors that point to the fact that they had a period of dividend stagnation in the mid to late 2000s. And while this is true, there was a reason for that. So at that point in time, the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan was actually on the, uh, in the midst of taking over BCE. So they were buying BCE out. And at that time, uh, the board uh, of BCE decided to, you know, hold the dividend steady. And that's normal. So when there's a takeover, typically what happens is the companies will stop raising a dividend. They won't stop paying it, but they will stop dividend growth over that period of time. So that was a highly contentious takeover that eventually ended up falling through. Had that, uh, had that not happened, then BCE would actually have one of the longest dividend growth stocks in the country today. Now we get into real estate investment trusts or REITs. Um, you know, this is best looked at uh, funds from operation. Uh, and adjusted funds from our operation. The important thing to realize about these two metrics is that they are non-GAAP, right? So they are very individualized by company. There is no standard. That said, FFO is probably the most common and there are most similarities between FFO and all the, and all the real estate investment trusts. AFFO is a little bit different. There is a little bit more vari variability there. And for the most part, uh, while some do post AFFO numbers, uh, some rates don't, uh, so it makes it compare. It makes comparing pretty hard. Um, next up, we have sorry, guys. I just had a pop up here. As we said, new technology. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we typically look for a payout ratio uh, for real estate investment trust below ninety percent. Uh, it's not out of the ordinary to see payout ratios between 90 and 100%, and in some cases, 100% and above. That's not necessarily an immediate sign that the dividend is going to be cut or anything like that, but it is something you'll want to monitor. It's not something that could be sustained over a long period of time, so it is something to be mindful of. So we tend to look for a target below 90%. 
And finally, we have pipelines. Uh, it's not a sector itself. It's, it's, it's more of an industry in the oil and gas sector. Uh, but they have a metric called distributable cash flow. And once again, it's, a, it's similar to free cash flow and adjusted funds from operation, but it's their own version of this metric. Pipelines, once again, high capex industry, going to have a lot of weird items in the, in the earnings side of things. So they look at distributable cash flow in terms of maintaining that dividend. A company like Enbridge, for example, they have a targeted payout ratio of 70 to 80%. Uh, so we anything below 80% in our mind is, is a good thing to look for. Okay, so let's summarize here with the payout ratio. You know, it's important not to rely on a single re, uh, on a single metric, right? And especially that standard payout ratio. Typically, what we are going to see is, especially beginner investors, they might look at the payout ratios and say, "Oh yeah, look, it's only 50%. It's safe." But if you look at it against cash flows. Maybe it's above 100%. So these are some things to look for. You know, and if the ratio is high, right? And when I say if it's high, I'm really talking about uh, against you know, their own historical average or their own industry average. Um, you, know, you really want to understand why that is. And we'll get into that a little bit uh, in, a, in a second. Um, and you know, we, have, we have many tools available to Stock Trades Premium members. Uh, we have a Stock Trade screener that will provide all this information for you. For example, you know, we, every quarter, we go into the right reports and we will uh, actually pull out all the FFO information and you know, the, the real kind of information that you can't find on just general sites. And we'll put that and make that available into the screener. So uh, you know, if you're interested, you can, you can join us two week free trial. Um, I believe my colleagues have posted a, a link in, the, in just below uh, the screen here where you can sign up and join, no credit card re required. And uh, yeah, so come check us out. We've got a lot of tools available. Um, and this is just one area where I think you know, we provide something unique to, uh, to investors. All right, let's get into number two. All right, chasing yield. So this is the second one, and this is one that is probably highly controversial. Um, we, we actually tend to get into it with a lot of heavy income investors in terms of you know, chasing yield. Uh, we understand there's a need for high yield in certain cases, uh, but chasing yield, let me explain what we mean by that, because I don't think it's, there's a common definition of what chasing yield actually means. So from our perspective, um, it really means that your, you know, your starting point is a high yield, obviously, right? So this could be a dividend stock that has maintained a dividend for years, or it might be a dividend growth stock, uh, you know, once again, like a, uh, a dividend aristocrat that has a high star starting yield. So you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, well, this company has maintained the dividend for 10 years, or they have a 10-year dividend growth streak. They're a well-known company. The dividend must be safe, right? And that's the end of their due diligence. And they buy the stock because the yield is high, might be higher than normal. And you're thinking, yeah, this is great. You know, the company has a strong reputation, good history of dividend growth. Um, and that's it. That's all they do. And you'd be surprised at how many investor due diligence there. So that's what we mean by chasing yield. It's, it's just looking at, you know, one or two things and then stopping that due diligence. So why is that? <laughs> well, I mean, why is that an issue? Well, there's no guarantee that the high yield is going to continue, right? So there may, the, the yield may be high for a reason. So we need to understand and ask ourselves the question, why is the yield high? Why is it higher than average? Why is it higher than the industry? Um, there's countless examples of you know, Canadian dividend aristocrats uh, that have cut the dividend. I would say probably on an annual basis, there's at least five to a dozen and that fall off the list because they either cut the dividend or they kept the dividend steady. And when a dividend growth stock that has a long history of dividend growth all of a sudden stops raising the dividend, that's a sign for concern, right? So, you know, there, there are many reasons why that yield might be high. Um, and it's never a guarantee, and past performance is never, you know, a guarantee of future success. So you always have to ask the question, why? And to illustrate this, I wanted to talk about Algonquin Power. Uh, and this is a, a, a very interesting case study. It is, has a lot of rev relevancy. When we, I mean, I think we all know by now, Algonquin Power ended up cutting the dividend. But uh, a few months ago, uh, we were probably on the, I guess, wrong side of the gen general narrative where once the company released earnings, we felt that the dividend was no longer safe. We weren't ready to come out and say that the dividend was going to be cut uh, in particular, but, you know, we, we did think it was in a, an inevitability and uh, that the dividend was certainly not safe, despite narrative to the contrary. And what do I mean by narrative? So first of all, yeah, you would have seen a lot of you know influencers or other investment services or even people you know pundits on TV talking about uh, you know Algonquin Power's strong history of dividend growth, right? 
I mean, this is a company that had, if you look, just look at this chart, it's, it's actually a very you know, beautiful chart. Uh, for the past 10 years, they had an excellent dividend growth rate. They raised the dividend. Once again, they had a double-digit growth rate. They raised the dividends uh, by uh, you know, 10% on an annual basis uh, through almost a decade. You know, the chart looks choppy here, but that's because they pay in USD. And, you, and because they pay in USD, this is reflected in CAD, so in Canadian. So it's actually choppy because of the interest rate fluctuations. But overall, they had a very strong history of dividend growth. This was a Canadian dividend aristocrat, right? Um, very strong company, popular company among income investors. Um, we owned it. Uh, uh, Dan owned it. I owned it. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, it was a feature of ours uh, premium years ago. Um, but it's because it was a very highly popular dividend growth stock. It had earnings that were growing and it had the dividend that was growing. So everything was fine until um, all of a sudden the company's uh, yield started creeping up, right? It used to trade in the, you know, in the, you know, four to five percent range and then it hit 10 percent. So, you know, the high yield was a direct result of a sharp, sharp decline in the stock price. And let's, let's visualize this, okay? So you'll see at the beginning of January uh, that the company's uh, yield was about, you know, 4 to 5% uh, through this period here. And then I would say in, a, in mid to late summer, it started, the share price started to drop and the yield started to rise. So what happened there? interest rates started to rise in a material way, right? This is when we started seeing, you know, every month the, you know, Bank of Canada and the Fed starting to raise their dividends, uh, sorry, started to raise in the rates at a pretty rapid pace, at a, at a pace we haven't seen in, you know, three decades. So that's what started happening. Now, here's the thing. This wasn't unique to Algonquin, right? All utilities, pipelines, telecoms, interest rate sensitive companies were kind of following a similar pattern. Their share price was under pressure and their yield was rising. So this wasn't really specific to Algonquin Power until earnings came out in November. And then you saw the share price crash, right? It went from the you know, $15, $16 range all the way down to $9. And as a result, you saw the yield go up to 10%. So that's a pretty you know, massive, uh, I guess, event in, in, in the company's history. So now you're looking at it, you're like, wow, you've got a company like Algonquin Power who has a strong history of dividend growth who is now yielding 10%. So chasing yield would be going out and buying Algonquin Power for the 10% yield, because A, it's very attractive, right? Um, and B, Algonquin's a, a big name, uh, and they have a history of dividend growth. So, you know, the dividend must be okay. Well, we know that's not the case. Um, if you looked at the data itself as well, um, the payout ratios didn't tell the whole story, right? Because 60%, uh, I, the dividend accounted for 60% of AFFO, which actually isn't bad, to be honest with you. Uh, the problem was, if you, you had to dig deeper, right? Um, and they had to delay the Kentucky Power Acquisition. And this was a big deal, because they entered into this acquisition at a period of time in low rates. So this was before, you know, months and months before the rates started to rise. They entered into this ac acquisition uh, to buy Kentucky Power. And, you know, to do so, they took on floating rate debt which is interest rate sensitive. So as rates go up, their interest expense on that debt goes up. So to put that in perspective, they had a floating rate debt, 20, 22% of their debt was floating rate. That is extremely high to be, you know, uh, I guess, uh, I guess um, exposed to high interest rates. When you compare that to a company like Brookfield Renewable, they were only sitting at 3%. So that's a huge discrepancy, right? So that means 22% of your debt load. And remember, utilities already have high debt loads to begin with. But 22% is exposed to interest rate sensitivity. To illustrate this further, um, AQN posted this chart uh, where they expected the floating rate debt to uh, exceed $3 billion by, by January. And this is from the November presentation. Um, and so what you see here is the amount of floating rate debt taken on to acquire Kentucky Power, right? So that is some pretty big numbers. The company also came out and said that I think for every percentage point, it would result in uh, $20 million extra in expenses. And this was as of, I think, sep end of September, if I'm not mistaken. So we didn't even get, you know, uh, into more interest rates that subsequently happened after. So the company was still heavily exposed to rising rates over the course of the fall. So when we looked at this, you know, you know, myself and Dan, and we were looking at it, and we're like, hmm, you know, this, this just doesn't feel right. Um, and it's not really good business practice to be paying out 10% of their dividend. It's just, it's just not good business practice. You want to be able to reinvest back in the business and, and, and fuel growth. And you're, you have a hard time doing that when you're, you know, paying out 10% in cash. So these were red flags for us. 
Um, and I'm going to transition to a bonus mistake because this was very prevalent with Algonquin Power. Never trust ma management. Now, being a little facetious here, but it's true <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, so what happened after earnings um, is AQN went on a little bit of a roadshow. They started doing interviews and things like that. But out of, one investment service came out after the, the, the call and said, our conclusion from the call was that AQN is not planning to cut its dividend in the short term and that it seems to be strongly favoring cutting growth capex and selling down assets opportunistically instead. When combined with the insider purchases, we believe AQN offers very attractive risk reward. So why did they come to that conclusion? They came to that conclusion because they trusted management. So if you look, I'm going to, uh, I bolded a few items here, right? So, I mean, it's not planning to cut its dividend. And this was a common theme. I'm telling you, when we were on Twitter and we were talking about it, I, 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 feel, I felt like me and Dan were in a minority saying that the dividend wasn't safe. Now that said, insider purchases, if you look at that, I'm going to leave that one aside because that's warrants a whole other webinar. Um, you know, we don't really rely on insider purchases as being an indication either way uh, that the stock is uh, a buy or a sell. Um, and we can talk in a bit later, but I'm going to ignore that piece for, for now. What I want to focus on is cutting growth capex and selling down assets opportunistically instead. So if you read that, does that make good business sense? Like if you step back and pretend you're not an income investor, right? You're just an investor. Let's just say you're a growth investor. Or you're not an income investor. And you look at this, that they are cutting growth capex and they're going to sell down assets to maintain the dividend. That just isn't good business practice. As soon as that comes out, I would say dividends being cut, right? Because at the end of the day, if I'm a board member, which who, by the way, are the ones who make the decisions, not management, the board is the one who makes the decision on the dividend. If I'm sitting there as a, bull, as a board member, uh, and I have some experience in this, uh, you know, I didn't mention it in my intro, but I, I did sit on an audit committee of a $150 million utility company. So <laughs> I, I kind of have some, some expertise here uh, in the sense that you are not doing your fiduciary responsibility if this is your plan, simply to appease income investors. So to me, that was an immediate red flag when I saw that come out. But management was saying, right, they, they didn't plan on cutting the dividend. And then they also did an interview with a, a, I guess, a popular blogger and a, I guess, they also have a firm, so they're a firm, but they also, you know, post on sites like Seeking Alpha. Um, and this was the comment made by management. So while we aren't announcing our dividend plan and growth targets just yet, that will be at the upcoming investor day, which was in January, which subsequently is where they actually ended up cutting the dividend. Um, what I will say is that while we're viewing our growth targets and plan moving forward in light of the changing environment, even if it were to take three or four years to get our payout ratio within our target range, we still think that our current dividend makes sense. Once again, when you're reading that, you're like, why? If it's going to take you three to four years to get back to your payout ratio, is that really good business sense, right? At the end of the day, it's not. Um, so when we say don't trust management, that's what we're talking about. Management went into PR mode, if you will, after those earnings because the share price crashed to, we, as we saw, about $9 per share. So they went into PR mode. They were doing damage control. And we've seen this countless times. Um, you know, a past indication is not a future indication of success. Um, and we've seen this countless times before. We've seen it with Interpipeline, Vermilion Energy, Atla Gas. These are all companies in recent years whose management teams have come out in support of the dividend that wasn't sustainable but only to end up cutting it a few you know, months later. Uh, so when I say never trust management, um, you know, I, let the numbers do the talking and, and let common sense prevail, if you will. Um, so it, let's, let's summarize chasing yield here. You know, I'm not against uh, uh, yield, high yield companies. Uh, both myself and Dan actually own quite a few. Um, you know, it's, it's the fact that you never want to blindly chase yield, right? So the Algonquin Power is a perfect example of that. We had, you know, there were so many people that were chasing that yield because it looked attractive. But once again, there was a reason for that. And it's important to understand that reason. And that, and that is where due diligence comes in. It's a must. If you're investing in high yield stocks, um, once again, it's not a bad thing. Just make sure you do your due, your due diligence. All right, let's get on to uh, number three, which is almost the flip side of chasing high yield, which is ignoring low yielders. So let's start by defining what a low yielder is. Typically, I mean, if you're talking to most in general, it is a yield that is below the market average. Uh, I would say most dividend uh, growth investors or income investors actually have their own targeted yield. Uh, so they may, for example, screen out companies that are below two or two and a half percent, right? Um, 
the important takeaway here is that a low yield stock is not going to return a ton of income today, right? It's, it's not a real strong income option today. There's a reason why I say today, because it's problematic when you're looking at it from that perspective. Uh, you might actually miss out on some high growth companies that actually have higher dividend growth rates than your high yielders. And over time, especially over a 20, 30 year period, that low yielder may end up generating more income from you, for you uh, in 20 years time than a high, yield, uh, than a high yielder high yielder will. Um, and in, if that happens, you're likely going to see a greater total return, which is the crux of all this. And there's a philo philosophical difference between, uh, you know, investing for total returns and investing for income. So total returns, um, really, at the end of the day, um, if you have a low yield, but a high dividend growth company, right, let's, let's say you have a company yielding 2%, but it's growing the dividend at a double-digit clip over the past decade. You know, one can really only do that if they have a strong underlying business. Typically, if you're going to sustain a high level of, uh, uh, of dividend growth over a long period of time, that has to be underpinned by earnings and cash flow expansion, right? So, so you're just not going to raise a dividend by 20% and have your earnings and cash flow decline over that period of time. No. If you can sustain 20% dividend growth over a decade, it's likely that your earnings and cash flow are also growing materially. So what happens after that? It's pretty simple math, right? If you can grow your earnings and cash flow by double digits, it's likely that that's going to be followed by significant share price appreciation and subsequently significant outperformance. So once again, let's use an example to illustrate this. Alimentation couche tower. So, you know, this is a, you know, a popular stock of ours, uh, both myself and Dan own it, I believe. Um, and it is a dividend growth stock and one that we are big fans of. If you look at the information here, and this is pulled from our stock trades uh, premium screener, which we discussed earlier, um, you can see here that the company has a payout ratio of 12%. So that's your standard earnings pay, uh, payout ratio, 12%. When you look at it against cash flows, you have free cash flow and operated, operational cash flow of you know 11%. So these are really low payout ratios. You have a dividend growth streak of 13 years. Once again, strong, long history of dividend growth. And you also have um, you know double-digit dividend growth over the past one and five-year periods. You know, 18% over five years, that's pretty strong dividend growth rate, right? On average. Um, so all of this, it looks like a very really strong dividend growth stock. The problem is. It wouldn't even make people screeners if they screen out, uh, you know, yields below a certain amount because it only yields 0.86%, right? So this is not very attractive to people that need income today. Um, and unfortunately, uh, dividend growth investors may actually completely ignore this company. And when you look at the next screen, you'll see why that's a mistake. Look at this return over a 10-year period, 10 year period. Alimentation Couchetard grew by 680% over a 10-year period. And the index at 119%. And this includes dividends reinvested, right? So, you know, that's a pretty impressive outperformance. So it's not surprising that the company has a low yield, right? Even though it's growing the dividend at a 20% clip, um, its share price is growing just as, just as fast. So that means the yield is going to remain low. Doesn't mean that you're not going to generate more income year over year as it grows that dividend. Not only that, you're also be benefiting from a higher share price. So that's what we mean by, you know, why it's an issue when you ignore uh, lower yields, especially for those who are just starting out. Like if you're a 20 year old and you have a 30 or 40 year investment horizon, ignoring a low yield like this, you know, you could be missing out on some pretty massive gains. When it comes to building wealth, right? You want to look at total returns. Now I'm not saying that, you know, investing in, you know, high yielders is, is a bad thing. It's, this is very situation specific, right? You may be in retirement, and you might be living off your dividend income. Well, in that case, a stock like Alimentation Couchetard may not make sense, right? Because it's only yielding 1%. You might prefer a bank that's yielding, you know, 5% versus Alimentation Couchetard. But that's okay. It's very situation specific, right? So keep that in mind. But in our opinion, the longer your investment horizon, the more you might be leaving on the table if you're ignoring low yielders, right? So keep that in mind if you if you like the dividend growth strategy, uh, you know, Please, uh, you know, take total returns into consideration, um, especially if you have a long-term horizon, uh, as mentioned. So, you know, it's not, it's never a, a be-all and end-all. There's never a right way of doing things. 
Um, everything is always uh, situation specific. But if you look at total returns from companies such as like, you know, Canadian National Railway, we talked about Arimatazian Kustar or Waste Connections, WCN, um, you know, these have a long and stored history of returning outsized performance. Not only that, you can actually make homemade dividends, which I'm not going to get into today, but you can actually sell a stock and actually, you know, generate cash flow by selling a stock. Uh, so just because you have a low yield uh, doesn't mean that you can't generate income from that low yielder if the share price is growing at a 20% clip on an annual basis. Okay, so with that, I'm going to wrap things up here. Um, you know, so we, we spent the first half hour of this session going over three dividend mistakes. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, I guess, leave you with some reflections. It's something I like doing uh, when I present, uh, and as opposed to just asking for questions, I, I like to make people think a little bit. So if you're looking, thinking back on these scenarios and these mistakes, um, you know, what is one key takeaway that you can make a new habit of, right? So as an investor, uh, we all have habits, right? We all have a way of doing things uh, and, and how we go about doing uh, and, and doing our due diligence. So what I would ask is that you think back and you take one, one key takeaway that you can kind of embed in your regular practice. Think of what that is. You know, we gave you lots of different options here. Obviously, in, in an hour and a half an hour, we can only go over so much. Um, you know, if you're a Stock Trades Premium member, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we welcome you to, uh, obviously, we're always in Discord and we answer a lot of questions. So we're constantly in contact with our premium members. So, you know, once again, you can, you can have a look at the, at the, at the free trial, um, you know, two weeks. And if you want to join us and kind of get a feel for what kind of, um, you know, interaction we have, but yeah, make, make a new habit. So think of one. And then secondly, reflect, do some reflection. So think about a time that where you fell in one of these traps. Maybe you were one of those that chased uh, Algonquin Power for the 10% yield. Not to say that it, Algonquin Power won't rebound. I mean, you know, I, I firmly believe that if, depending on what happens with this, um, you know, Kentucky Power acquisition, Algonquin Power stock, stock price can rebound. Um, and Algonquin Power actually has, uh, I didn't show in the chart, but they actually ended up cutting a dividend back in the, I would say, mid to late 2000s. Um, and then they returned a dividend dividend growth for the next decade, right? So it's not that uh, AQN can't rebound, but if you were chasing AQN because of that 10% yield, you're likely disappointed, right? Because you bought it for the 10% yield and they cut the dividend. So, you know, think about what, if you had the benefit of hindsight, what would you do di differently next time? Okay, so that's the end of the formal part of the presentation. And I appreciate um, everybody for their time. Uh, we had a few little bugs at the beginning with sound. I, I'm hoping that got resolved for most of you who couldn't uh, hear us. Um, and I did see that chat box up there for a bit. But I'm going to uh, stop sharing this screen here. And I'm going to, you know, wow, there's, there's Big Matt uh, chatting with all of you. Uh, now, let's see. I'm going to turn to uh, Dan and Dylan, who have been kind of moderating the chat. And uh, they have been uh, collecting questions for me. And one of the first questions that uh, that has come up is um, the Northwest. Okay, yeah. So, so this is a question that we've actually got a few times. Um, is uh, is Northwest Healthcare Properties uh, Real Estate Investment Trust safe? Ah, so, so I own Northwest. Uh, it's NWH.UN. Uh, that's the ticker. I own it. Um, and is it safe? That's a really good question. Let me walk you through quickly, uh, I guess, my thought process when I'm looking at this, okay? Now, remember, this isn't an indication to sell or anything like that, but I'm going to share, once again, go back to sharing my screen. So this is the uh, stock trade screening tool that I was telling you about, uh, but I am going to look up Northwest Healthcare, right? So nwh.un, I'm going to add that, I'm going to start comparing. Now this is going to provide. It's, this is going to pull up some data um, where you'll be able to see. It's. Uh, and I'm not sure if this is entirely visible. I'm going to maybe zoom in just a little bit here. Okay. So we have here. Uh, we talked about that for REITs. We want to look at you know the uh, FFO payout ratio, right? So earnings doesn't really mean a whole lot for for real estate investment trusts. We do want to look at, at cash flows. So when we look at it here, we have an FFO payout ratio of 109%. Now I can tell you. Uh, that based on our own experience, uh, that that 109% is above historical average. Now, the company itself has had uh, a high payout ratio, I would say, probably ever since mid-pandemic. So we're talking about a year and a half now, where it's had a payout ratio above 100% ever since the pandemic started. Um, so, 
that's an immediate warning sign for me. Um, not to say that the dividend was going to be cut or the dividend can't be sustained, but now we're talking about 100% over a period of years. The other thing I want to look at is uh, the FFO divided by interest. So this, this data point right here, this is very important for, for real estate investment trusts. So you take your FFO and you divide that by the interest. So the interest is the amount of interest on debt that you pay. Typically, you want to see this at least two at minimum. Um, and now it's at 1.32 which I can tell you is one of the lowest in uh, among all Canadian uh, real estate investment trusts. Um, there, there's no real strong comparison to uh, NWH uh, in, in, in Canada. Yeah, the way uh, that their business model is structured, there's no real good comparison. Um, but let's, you know, just for the heck of it, let me add, uh, let me add granite. Uh, it's not the same industry, but I'm going to add granite. So you can see what I'm talking about and how different that these numbers are. Mine takes a little bit longer to load because I'm on the back end side of things. Um, and when we're on the back end, everything, the whole site loads. So it takes a little bit of time. Okay. Uh, so look at here, FFO interest, 1.32. Look at granite, 8.07. That's a strong coverage ratio right there, right? So when you compare this and you compare this, you're like, wow, that's that's low. And I can tell you right now, the industry average is quite is 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 probably around three. Uh, so this here, one point three two, is very low. Uh, if you look at FFO payout ratio for granite, seventy two percent, right? So now you're starting to understand why I'm a little hesitant to say that Northwest dividend is safe. Now I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to look at their debt load. Right, because at the end of the day, uh, the higher the debt load, the more interest they're paying. So when you look at the debt load, you have, you know, a debt to equity of one point two three, right? Granite zero point four six. Once again, you know, this is a high number. Uh, so you know, over hundred percent, like that. That's a very high debt to equity ratio, and that's I'll, I will say, um, you know, I've been invested in Northwest properties for. I don't know, 10 years, simply because I like the business that they're in. It's different. Um, and, you know, obviously the pandemic changed things. Uh, I still own it, um, you know, but am I prepared to say that the dividend is safe? No, absolutely not. It, it's always been struggled with high debt loads, and now we're seeing the impacts of this. So it's not surprising that because it has such a high debt load, it's got a low um, in, uh, interest rate coverage ratio, right? So that's not surprising to me. Um, so if you look at the uh, discount to NAV that is trading at today, um, so, you know, this is, today is trading at a 31% discount to NAV, um, and granted it's only 8%, right? Well, there's probably a reason why it's trading at a 31% discount. It's got an 8.35% 8, 8 yield. That's a warning sign for me as well, because that's near the high end of the company's historical averages. I think last time it was this high was, you know, during that COVID crash. So when someone asked me, is NWH yield safe? My answer is, I'm not prepared to say it is safe. Now, once again, you know, there's there's cases where it may be able to maintain, be maintained and things like that. But this, to me, there's enough warning signs here for me to say that, no, it's not safe. Does that mean it's a sell? Not necessarily. Um, you know, once again, I own it because I like the exposure it has to a certain particular industry. Um, I'm not owning it for the yield. Um, but, you know, if someone's buying this, expecting to have an 8.35% yield, I would say, no, the dividend's not safe, um, you know, and, you know, there is a realistic chance that, you know, that dividend could get cut at some point. Not that it will, but, you know, when you compare it to something like granite and you look at the dividend, you know, the safety metrics here, you can see that granite is well better positioned to maintain their dividend, mind you, and they only have a yield of 3.8%, um, but you can see the differences, right? So this is what I'm talking about when we're talking about, uh, you know, doing due diligence. All right. Let's stop sharing that screen and we'll go back here. Hopefully I answered that question. Uh, next up, uh, bought AQN more than a year ago. Still have it. Should I sell? Ah, the famous question. Should I buy or should I sell? Um, so, you know, we, we never give buy or sell signals. I'll tell you that right now. I mean, you know, we it, everybody's portfolio is different. I always circle back to why did you buy Algonquin Power in the first place, right? So if you were one of those who bought Algonquin Power for the high 10% yield, well, you probably, you know, might be considered selling it because that, you know, investment thesis really is no longer relevant. They cut the dividend. They might do so again if the yield continues to remain high and that Kentucky Power acquisition doesn't close. I saw it was delayed again. Um, so, you know, there's really no insight on that Kentucky Power deal. So for me, that is a big overhang. Dan, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Dan already sold his. Um, I held on. Um, and, and I'm telling you why I, I held on. 
Uh, it's not because I like the stock. Um, I'm actually going to sell the stock. Um, I just think that there might be an opportunity to get out if the Kentucky Power deal uh, falls through. To me, that would be a positive, uh, uh, I guess, development for Algonquin Power is if Kentucky Power um, deal falls through. Uh, because then they would be able to pay off that debt and and uh, they can move on. So from my perspective, you know, I think that uh, it really depends on why you bought. Uh, to me, the investment thesis has changed. So I am looking to get out. It's no longer one of the best dividend growth stocks in the country. It's no longer, uh, you know, the fastest growing utility, considering it is looking at selling off assets. Now, you know, we'd have to see further insights into the Kentucky Power acquisition if it does close. So if it does close, you're likely going to see some, you know, I guess part of it, positive impact to earnings and revenue potentially. But once again, it's been delayed for so long and they have such high floating debt uh, that the longer this goes on, the worse it is for Algonquin Power. So it's really, you know, it's an individualized choice. I'm hanging on, uh, but really ultimately I'm looking to get out uh, either way. Uh, I'm just Honestly, I'm trying to time it right now. Probably not the best, you know, <laughs> but um, I would say that, you know, why did you buy it in the first place? Is it be, is, if it's because it had a strong growth rate and it was one of the best dividend growth stocks in the country, that investment thesis is out the window. Okay, uh, what else we got? Hopefully that answered your question without answering your question. Uh,